live from the Balls Visual Radio Studios, this is the Blades on Ball Show. And now, here's your host, the voice of South African rugby himself, Hugh Bladen. Hugh, it's over to you. Hello, Nas. Hello, Blades. Hi, right now, guys, we have got we have got the man who scored the most Absa Curry Cup points in history. When my question this morning, I always pose a question, Nas, and I said, obviously, obviously you the obvious guy who's won, the, who's got the most points, who was the guy who's got the second most points, and quite a few guys got Willem de Vol. They all said Sid Nomus, Nas. So Sid Nomus <laughs> is here with me. Say hello, hello. Nas. Hello, Sid. Uh, yeah, I gather. Uh, Sid, you, you did play in the 71 Curry Cup final, uh, Transvaal, Northern Transvaal, didn't you? No, I got injured the, the game before. I pulled the hamstring. Oh, you got yeah. injured. That's yeah. why That's why you could only pull off a draw with the Bulls, <laughs> with the referee. And uh, I'll give you a thousand reasons why the Bulls should have won that one, but okay. they never did. You know, you can just give me one reason. <laughs> no, Sydney, I can tell you, Sydney did play, <laughs> Sydney did play in the 68 final at Loftus, which the Bulls also won. Yeah. And I might Yeah, lose. and I, uh, can you believe it? I was at that final, eh? 68. You were? How old I were was you? 10 years old. Yeah, <laughs> I was 10 years old. Were you Love a it. ball boy? No, 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 no. I was never a ball boy. Um, were, I was, you uh, were, don't tell me you uh, were. Don't a great tell, spectator. Don't tell me you were playing. <laughs> 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 no, I know Transvaal wasn't that great, but they weren't that bad either. No, so I, wonder, I want to ask you, I, you know, after the game on Saturday, we went and watched... Uh, I went to the boys, Bros and, and Joel and, and Toka and them to the to uh, a suite there. And, I mean, what is it about Stormers, Bulls, that there's so much aggro? I don't know. Um, I'm a little bit surprised with the aggro on the weekend. I know everybody wanted to win and everybody wanted to do, do well. And, yes, they all played really well. And I, I must say, the Stormers played an exceptional game. Yeah, yeah. But um, I was a little bit of su uh, surprised with the off-the-ball incidents. But, um, you know, it's also good, uh, Blades, that, um, you know, when you, when you play the game on the field, um, play like they played on the weekend because uh, they really, really got stuck into the Bulls. And now the Bulls, uh, by hook or by crook, may be a little bit more aware of what might happen in the, in the semi-final. Yeah, because, I mean, do you think they just, they, I mean, I wasn't studying the game. Obviously, we were just, you know, there and there were quite a few people around. And, and uh, I mean, were the Bulls just outplayed or? Yes, I think so. No, I, I believe that uh, they, they were out in the first place. And that's where, if you go and uh, go back to Australia, uh, British Lions, uh, what happened in the third test? They were out scrumped. Yeah. You go last week, Craven Week game, Bulls against uh, Western Province. Um, they were out scrumped, and I think people just totally underestimate the the value of scrumming, yeah. and um, and the Stormers just out scrumped the Bulls. But that's a, a big problem because the whole season we've been talking about the Bulls scrum that's not settled, that's not dominating or not actually holding their, their own on on their own ball. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when that happens, and I've seen it on a number of occasions, that's why I'm a great believer lately that teams need to seriously sort out their scrumming. Uh, because after, you know, if you're on the back foot in the scrum, you lose forwards or going backwards, the scrum of five has got too much pressure. And that, that actually happened to the Bulls. And then uh, you could see after 60 minutes, they said, OK, we're not going to win this one. And they pulled off uh, some of the senior players, but um, they were actually outplayed uh, up till, what, 60 minutes, and that was yeah. the end of it then. You mm. know what is, I mean, what is surprising? You've got, you've got Dion Grayling, you've got Chili Boy, you've got Werner Creel, Springboks, all three in your front row. I mean, you've got Grant Hutton, who, who perhaps is a better loose forward than a lock. But I mean, why is that scrum so dicky? See, see I, I don't know. You know, sometimes if you go and, and you analyze a, a great scrum, it's all eight working together. I think sometimes teams get to a point where they believe the tight five should scrum or the front row should scrum, and, and that can never work. And, yeah, uh, sure. and if you look at, uh, at uh, the Stormers on the weekend, as a unit, they worked absolutely fantastic, uh, and that's why they put the pressure on the Bulls. 
And uh, <coughs> we've seen, um, go back to some of the last number of Curry Cup uh, games that we've seen. You start struggling in the scrums. Um, then the Sharks that won Curry Cup final, they couldn't throw a ball in straight, but they started struggling in the scrums. And it's all about uh, scrumming for me at the moment. And uh, and I'm just absolutely surprised the Bulls just can't sort out their scrumming because the whole season they've been under pressure. And yeah. every time they play well and go and have a look, uh, they, their scrum is actually nice and settled. Let's go back to another game that I can put on the table. You remember the Sharks playing the Crusaders in London at Twickenham? Yes. What happened that day? The Sharks got out scrums. You, we, we've all seen that. And how badly did the Sharks play in that game? And that's why I say, players, it's, people need to, to wake up a little bit more. It's, 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 it's a great opportunity, especially in scrums, to put pressure on the opposition. And, uh, and I can't believe that there are still coaches that think it's just the restart of the game. Yeah, it's, I think it's a, it's a very good point. Because <coughs> just to reiterate what you, you say, Every side that's really out scrummed the opposition have have you know ninety nine times out of a hundred come out on top, and anyway precisely yeah. and uh, and that's scary actually if you think about it because uh, how many times have we heard coaches said yeah but it's only to restart the game it's not to restart the game you it's that's where you can actually actually dominate and and take control of a game and we've seen it we've seen it on the weekend so we don't even have to go into archives we've seen it on the weekend the Bulls got out scrummed. Suddenly the line-out struggle, the loose forward struggle, you're on the back foot, you defend. Then suddenly the Bulls had to start kicking the ball away. You didn't want to kick a ball away, especially against the back three at the, uh, against the Stormers, at the back three of the Stormers. And that's what happened. So you, instead of playing, you're actually defending. And... Uh, you don't want to play rugby like that, to be honest. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, so I've I've always said. I mean, for the last couple of weeks, and I think for a few seasons, for obvious reasons, I've always said, beware the Crusaders. I mean, statistically looking at it, there there could be a Bulls Crusaders final. Uh, yeah, but I think at the moment it might even be. Uh, we can actually hope to uh, get them in a semi-final because see the thing is if the stormers or if the cheetahs beat the brumbies for argument's sake yeah the cheetahs will play the chiefs and then the bulls will play the crusaders and i would rather rather play them in a semi-final especially at, at home yeah um and and uh, if if the brumbies win then of course uh, it's a different ball game we're playing the brumbies and then the chiefs will play the crusaders but uh the way they've been playing at the moment is you don't really want to play them at all. But uh, somewhere along the line, um, you know, I can't really see uh, the Reds doing anybody a favor on the weekend. I'll be surprised, but if you go a little bit into Ewan McKenzie's uh, history this season, he's beaten um, all four New Zealand sides he played against. Yeah. And I think maybe that's why they went into the game and said, because if I went into that game, seriously, I would have considered maybe not winning. Where they, uh, the Waratahs also didn't really play all that well. But, um, you know, at the end, the Reds is going to Christchurch. And it looks like Ewan McKenzie uh, doesn't mind playing against New Zealand sides. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's all, uh, I mean, it's all going to be, I think, uh, pretty interesting. What do you reckon, having watched, uh, you probably watch more Super Rugby matches than anybody else? I would, I would think if there was one team that the Cheetahs can actually go and beat, it's actually the Brumbies. Because Jake's actually playing a little bit like a South African game uh, pattern at the moment. Uh, good defense, uh, not really taking too many risks, and try and, and play territorial uh, rugby. And I think the Cheetahs can actually surprise them. But I can't see the Reds surprising the Crusaders. Um, but... Uh, Normally, it works out one, two, three, four. So it looks like it will be Chiefs, Crusaders, and uh, Bulls, Brumbies. But I still think there's a good outside chance for the Cheetahs to surprise the Brumbies. So, I mean, one's got to say the Cheetahs have done brilliantly this season. Huh? Yeah, and uh, we work a little bit with the fitness guy, uh, Neil Duplessis. And, uh, you know, I've learned a couple of things that um, actually... He, he surprised me with the, the, the training methods and uh, the principles in the training and whatever. And I'm not, after working with him a little bit, 
I'm absolutely not surprised that um, that the cheetahs are in a position where they are at the moment. Yeah, great. Okay, Nas, just hold on. Simon, Simon's here. He wants a question. Yeah, I just want to ask Nas. Um, there was talk last week, Nas, about uh, this proposed Super 18 from 2016. They're trying to cut down the the number of games that players play and the welfare of the players. Uh, as someone that, that watches so much Super Rugby, what do you think needs to happen to the tournament? You see, um, I think what they can do is rather go up to uh, a Super 20, but make it in two groups. Get them Canada, get America, get everybody involved, because Europe has been sorted out in any case. We've seen the Heineken Cup, and that, that's a fantastic competition. That's one. Uh, you can get more teams involved, get two groups. So you've got nine games that you play, and that's, that's, a, that's a shortened season. Uh, the thing is, it's, it's not about too much rugby, because if you think about it, the guys played 13 rounds. The, the difference is we seen seven games a weekend. That's why we think it's a lot of rugby. It's only, you, as a player, you only play one game a weekend. So it's not that much rugby. And then a number of players that didn't play international rugby had off for like a month. Uh, now they played three weeks. Now a number of the players are off again if you're not in the playoffs. Uh, if you do well, um, you know, of course you're going to play more games than the rest, but that's what you want because you want to be the better team. And if you look at, uh, at Messi last season, he played over 50 games. And nobody complains because there they play Euro Cup and they play yeah. Championship and yeah. they play League. And the, the thing is, we're watching rugby the whole weekend and then we say, oh, there's too much rugby. It's, the players still play only one game. But what I would like to say is I still think seriously we need to consider a global season where everybody starts in March, everybody finishes in October. The players got three or four months of good break and you will see definitely better quality. Because the thing is, Simon, what we need to, to seriously consider at the moment is why is all the big ball carriers all injured? Uh, injured yeah. Because they're taking 10, 15 knocks more per game because that's the game plan. Maybe, maybe some of the coaches should think of a little bit of a different game plan. And because Willem Alberts can only take so many knocks before he's going to get injured. Dwayne Vermeil and the same. And, you, and that's not a surprise to me that the bigger ball carriers are all injured. Yeah, I made the point uh, a couple of weeks ago that every single one of those big ball carriers has been injured. injured. It's not a matter yeah. of if, and it's that's, a that's of because win. of game plans. It's not because of too many, too much rugby. To be honest, it's because uh, you know, and and what what we don't see is the offload, because sometimes if 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 you can get the attention of the defender and you can offload, uh, then it's easy. But you know, Blades, and we've seen it, Simon. Is there are certain players you know if he gets the ball, he's never going to pass the ball in any case. So the double heat comes on those players. Yeah. And that's why. They that's why they, they're them, just yeah. taking too many knocks. Well, so them. I think it's a little, you have to adapt a little bit of the game plan too. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, you see a guy like Kieran Reid. In, in fact, I, you know, I'm not, a great, I'm not a great fan of this term offload. Because basically, it's a pass. You know, we used to always say, pass the ball, pass it the ball, pass, pass right, the but, ball. But then you must yeah. be able to pass. That's why they call it an offload. Yeah. With, with the <laughs> 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 uh, we, we've got a, a Twitter here from Devout Nell, who says, and you, I mean, having been in pro rugby for, for so long, his question is, what's going on with the contract management at the Bulls? Players leaving before contracts are finished, left, right and centre. Have you got comment on that? No, I, 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 no, I believe that, uh, not too much knowledge about it, but I think players getting contracted to play Super Rugby, then they get contracted to play Curry Cup Rugby. Some of your better players get contracted to Super Rugby and Curry Cup Rugby. But at the end, if a player wants to move on, let him move on because, you know, in all fairness, he doesn't want to be uh, around uh, your uh, unit in any case. And uh, that's the last guy you actually want involved is a guy that doesn't want to be there. So I've always been a great believer, you know, if you want to move on, move on. The sooner the better because uh, it gives me a better opportunity to work with the next guy. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I, I, w I would agree with that. But so there's so many players going overseas. I mean, oh, I mean. The, yeah, but, but Siri, yeah. Siri, we need this. And I, and I know I'm maybe out of line, but we need this because we need to revisit the structures. We need to revisit uh, this whole thing of, yes, of course, we want to look after our own local market. Mm -hmm. And I've mentioned it yesterday to somebody. I said, what we don't want 
is we don't know what we want is the better players to to play and make a lot of money because they deserve that. Yes. And they can only play for 10 years and then they retire. And what you don't want to see is you don't want to see rugby players retire and then they can't find the job and they all fall to pieces. What we want is players play for 10 years and then you actually retire like any soccer or basketball of American football player. Mm-hmm. That's what we would like to see. But more important for me is if a guy plays overseas, let's say you said you played overseas and you score the best wing for, for the country, then you should play for the, for the national team. That's professional sport. Yes, we would like to play uh, play more local players, but what we don't want is we don't want to go to a World Cup in four years' time and every team is an average of 22-year-old um, uh, players no that, that goes yeah. into a World Cup. Then we can just call it the under-22 World Cup. We don't want that. We <laughs> want the best players to go and play in the World Cup. And if that means 10 guys come in from overseas to play for us in the World Cup, then so be it. Or, or and that's the one thing that nobody wants to hear, it's make it privately owned franchises. That means you buy the team, you pay me whatever you want, and I can stay here. But at the moment, it's not going to happen because we don't run it like that. And that's why more players move. It's going to put pressure on the rugby officials to make the better decisions. And we need that. We seriously need that. Oh, yeah. We're in a professional sport. We're not in a professional sport, and we've had, we have an amateur sort of attitude. Well, yeah, I think the, one of the problems is that we are professional sports still run by committees. No, that is my point. Now, let's say, let's say, for argument's sake, and I don't want to just throw names around, okay? Let's say Johan Rupert buys the Stormers. He can, he can pay Brian Abana, Skullberg, or whatever he wants. Yeah. At the moment, it, it, it can't happen. It, it just can't happen. That's why if Brian gets an 8 million rand contract overseas and he's only getting four years, who can blame him? To Absolutely. move on, but yeah. if he's still uh, if there's still a value coming out of him for South Africa, he should still be regarded uh, as the number one wing. Now, because he plays somewhere else, we say no, no, we need to pick a local guy. Why? No, it's I, the I better player to play in the more. national side. Become more professional, and you know, as they do in soccer, it doesn't matter where you play. No, but in that's the world, why I say that's player. going to you see it's going to force now some rugby officials and or the IRB. The RB must just, and that's why the global season actually makes more sense than anything else at the moment. Yeah, but there's no loyalty. I mean, you take Brian Abana. I mean, what about the Curry Cup for Western Promise then? There's just no loyalty. I mean, you know, the. the but back, it's professional, the sir. Yeah, but Siri, I hear you. I Siri, hear you. Siri, yeah. I, 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 you know, I agree, but what, you know, loyalty uh, is. Uh, is uh, the storm is going to pay my uh, water and lights account? Are yeah. they going to buy me food every month? Well, or they are. are they going to pay my no, clothing account? No, no, I've got to do it myself. So the better I play, the more money I can make. That's what it's all about. Mm. And that's where the thing that we need to move on. I've seen this morning on, uh, on was it ESPN? Uh, yeah. See, what happens in America, that's why people sign five and seven year contracts. They sign a contract for seven years for 52 million US, but he's guaranteed like 25 million US. Now, you can sign a Brian Abana for five years, but then guarantee him 15 million or 20 million. But the problem is we don't have that kind of money in the game at the moment because we've got to look after a number of other structures to make sure we've got a great foundation to, to build from. Mm. Yeah, That's why yeah. I say it's, we need to revisit the number of our structures. Yeah, those you well the unions have got to look at schools and under twenties and under nineteens and that whole precisely. sort of thing. And, but and they Blake, don't you have can't the, go without that. So yeah, there yeah. must be money going into those structures. Definitely, yeah. But unfortunately the the franchise uh, scenario yeah. must be revisited. Yeah, all right. Well uh, so I mean, better players must get more money, that's what it's all about. Really uh, but a lot of food for thought. Now said uh, Thanks yep. for talking to us. It's always an absolute pleasure. And, uh, and you make you big know, sense. Right? Your enthusiasm <laughs> for the game never wavers. It's absolutely... You know, guys out there, sometimes Nas goes to the studio at 4 o'clock in the morning and leaves at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night. So, uh, well done, Nas. And, uh, okay, th- thanks, Blake. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the call. For and bye, City and Cheers. Simon. Bye, Nas. Cheers, my Take boy. care. Bye thanks, bye. Hey. That was the Blades on Ball Show. Join the voice of South African rugby on your wireless next Monday for more unbelievable memories and banter. Until then, stay classy, like 20-year-old Glenn Morangi classy.